Welcome back to the garden here in Raleigh, North Carolina, Zone 7B. This is the sixth part of a very detailed tour we're doing of the garden here in Raleigh. Generally, our, our garden tours are, we bounce around and just kind of show you the highlights of the garden, but we wanted to do a more thorough tour. We hadn't done one in a couple years. And it just kind of, folks that have been following the channel um, can go and see how some of these things have performed in the ground over an extent, more extended period of time. There is a playlist on the channel called New House, and you can go to that playlist and go back and see the very beginning of this project uh, if you want to. Uh, we welcome you to follow along with it. Uh, so uh, we're second half of this kind of middle bed in the back garden. Um, I think you, I've got some uh, drone footage up. This, we have a, we're in the process of turning a grassy area there into a patio in front of this area. None of these stones have actually been set. They're actually sitting here so that um, we don't track the, uh, the base material everywhere. And then there's a path back here behind us. And we've put kind of a larger group of material right through the middle of it just to kind of make folks go back to the other side. And we've had a tour group here and others here. And it does, in fact, this, the material here's finally gotten large enough that it does make people inquisitive and they go to the other side on the other side of the path uh, from where the patio uh, from where the patio view is. We lost some perennials this winter and have some that are coming back a little less vigorous. And if you continue to watch this series of videos, you're gonna see some of our native perennials out by the road thriving in much more harsh conditions than a few of the ones that are back uh, in the garden back here. There's some uh, Liatris spicata, which is a great native. Uh, and out at the road, it's this big. And back here, it's this big. Uh, we've had also had some things chewing on it, but even, even the flower spike that has not been chewed on is only a foot and a half tall. So I just want to point that out, that sometimes we improve this soil quite a bit back here and it's been great for the shrubs, it's been great for some things, it's been great for these, you know, the dahlias and a few other things, but it hasn't been necessarily great for some of our native perennials. And as we move out there, you'll definitely see what I mean. You know, things that are literally double in height. There are, we showed in maybe the fourth video, uh, our seedling dahlias over by the fence and they're all interesting intermixed uh, seeds uh, that we collect in the garden and then plant out here and they have easier access for the pollinators but we do have some hybrid uh, dahlias out here as well and uh, some of these you know have also been bred to be much more sturdy you know upright plants uh, uh, and this one's just blooming this one's just blooming uh, like mad out here there's an amsonia right here this one's called storm cloud it's really a fantastic plant. Uh, every, every garden we've seen this one in, it's just, it's finished blooming at this point. In fact, they're seed, seed pods right here. Uh, it's a great early flowering, lavender blue flower, lavender blue flower Amsonia, and they're quite full uh, in, in, the, in the ground. Again, I'm, I'm struggling a bit with some of, our, some of our perennials in this border. Just I think we just kind of overdid the garden prep uh, for some of these. And again, uh, like a lot of the salvias, the annual salvias and stuff that were in the uh, that I talked about in the last one, they're thriving in it. Uh, so it is some sort of learning curve, you know, even after 37 years of doing this, that some of these perennials will take a lot of bed prep, you know, and, and really thrive in it and grow like crazy in it. But some of our natives just actually want to just go in the, they just want to go directly in the ground and they tend to thrive uh, just in our clay based soil here this salvia is called salgoon lake tahoe we had one of the other salgoon uh, salvias in the last one these are just so beautiful this dark purple it has a dark purple and then it has the almost black calyx uh, toward the back you can see how full this plant is uh, this one's this one's new this season and really taken off as you can hear I, I don't know if you could hear the bees uh, flying around me we have so many things uh, on all of these uh, salvia out here there is one agastache that came back from uh, last from last winter right here and it's just just getting started we were missed we definitely lost a few perennials during that december freeze and uh, but occasionally one's still poking its head up here and there so uh, hoping that thing will establish itself enough this season and be vigorous uh, next year this is a Veronica from the Southern Living Plant Collection. Uh, this is a pink moody blues. There's a, a purple version of this as well. This thing just flowers all summer long. It just never ever quits. And what we'll do when these flower spikes just continue to bloom like this, at some point they slow down like this one has. Once we see the majority of the plant looks like that, we'll just come in here, cut this thing in half basically, 
and it'll just flush right back out and keep blooming. This one will bloom right through the, uh, the fall, another great, great pollinator plant. Jumping back to the middle of the bed, again, we're looking for things that were not gonna get crazy, crazy tall uh, in this area, but again, leave some mystery as to what's on the other side of the bed. And it gives us multiple bed edges. You know, we have, by constructing paths through your garden like this, you can create lots of spaces where you can have ground covers and lower growing perennials or annuals, and then you can step it up. So we can step this bed up to here, and we can do that on every single bed edge in the entire garden. And it allows you to have, find more places for things we just keep bringing back to this garden. This is Little Joe, Joe Pieweed. We have one in the front garden you'll see in the next video that's probably already 10 to 12 feet tall. Uh, this one does stay compact and I can confirm it's very compact because it's actually in a little more shade than it would like to be in. So it should be, it's gonna be even taller. It's gonna be taller here than it would be in someone's full sun garden, but you can see it's about to start blooming. This is a little early uh, for Joe Pieweed to start to show some color here in the uh, middle of June, but we have several things that are doing that uh, in the garden. But the foliage looks great on this one. Notice how compact it is, even though it's in a little bit of shade. The uh, pollinators go absolutely nuts for uh, Joe Pieweed. Uh, that, so that, there's a native perennial and here's a native shrub. This is Viburnum nudum, uh, wither rod viburnum, possum hall viburnum. This one goes by. Uh, it's reached uh, what uh, seven and a half feet or so at this point. Finished blooming. Um, and it, bloom, it blooms pretty early in the season. I do have some seed on here. So a few of these flowers did in fact uh, get pollinated and set seed. I might take a few of these seed and see uh, how easy they are to uh, to germinate here uh, once they're once they're finished maturing. Great looking plant. It's leaning a bit forward because the again there's shade behind it and it's kind of reaching out for the light a bit. But you can see how how great the foliage is. This one gets great fall color. A uh, lot of great lot of reasons to grow this uh, uh, native viburnum nudum. There are. About, I think, three white wedding hydrangeas in this garden. Two of them are you're about to see right now. Uh, absolutely loaded with flower buds. And I think this is the true test for this because it's, again, it's in, in a little more shade than hydrangea paniculata would probably like. But it blooms from the bottom of the plant to the top of the plant, any place it can get light along it. And the stems are so strong, even here in the shady space, uh, these are just really, really rigid. And if you have any experience growing Hydrangea paniculata is if we get rain when the, when the flower is fully open, if you get rain on them, it can be pulled down. The wind can knock them over uh, and, you know, they, and they stand back up, but they don't ever stand completely back up. This one just doesn't bend over. Uh, it's just really wild how, uh, how rigid that those stems actually are. This buddleia is called Grand Cascade, Grand Cascade butterfly bush. It has not started to show any color. We have, uh, we're probably 50-50 on our butterfly bushes at this point, ones that are blooming versus ones that are not uh, open yet. We have, uh, uh, it's just that year. It's been so cool through the spring. Normally by now, this would be in full color, but no problem. It's gonna bloom all summer long. And, and we can, you can deadhead these, these uh, the, the flowers on the, you know, the terminal bud flower here will bloom out first, and then you'll get these side shoots will bloom, we can just deadhead these. As these fade, you can just cut them and then you'll get more side shoots, you'll get more terminal buds and it will just continue on through the entire summer. This one was a little closer to the, to the uh, path out there last year and we actually slid it back in the late summer last year and got it back here to these mid-sized things. Uh, you know, on the tag, I think this one stays a little bit smaller than it actually does in the uh, real world, but it's a great plant really is a great full butterfly bush. Back out here to the front edge, here's a Leatris spicata that is, uh, does have a little bit more height on it. This one hasn't started to show some color. We'll see a couple in the front garden. The rabbits absolutely love this. This is kind of funny. We have a deer, we have a deer right now uh, and we also have rabbits. And so the rabbits eat the foliage from down below. And occasionally one of these will just be con taken completely off from the top down by a deer. Uh, they, both, they both love them doesn't seem to have any real negative impact on the plant. It just, you know, it'll take, they'll take, the deer will take two of the, the flower spikes and the rabbits will eat some of the foliage and it still just continues to, to come on and flower. This Monarda or bee bomb, we uh, uh, got from a neighbor's garden uh, a while back. So we don't actually know the variety on it, but I will tell you that, you know, this one, you know, Monarda or bee bomb can be a bully 
in the garden when it comes back up. We'll see another one out by the gate. And when they go to sleep and they come back, they're going to be much wider than when we went to sleep. And so you'll know that, you know, this one, we probably should have taken a little bit of this out, you know, from where it was originally planted this year. Next year, we're definitely gonna have to because it's, it's very happy in this space. Uh, as, as you can imagine with these red flowers on this one, you're gonna get hummingbirds on it. And of course, you're gonna get all the native bees. Native bees absolutely love bee balm. It's eating a powwow white uh, echinacea down below or coneflower. <laughs> it is still down there blooming, it's doing just fine. It's competing okay, but again, this uh, Minarda needs to be reined in a bit. This is a really exciting plant. This is this uh, Waikiki colocasia. This is a Southern Living Plant Collection one. These leaves will be this big as this thing starts to grow this summer. Just have gotten it in the ground. It's getting some roots under it and you can see new leaves coming. But as these leaves, uh, new leaves start to uncur uh, uncurl, they'll be bigger and bigger and bigger throughout the season. I expect this thing to be a bit this tall by the end of this, uh, by the end of this season. This is one we'll probably put back in a container uh, for the winter so we can move it in and out a few times and then we'll put it back in the garden uh, every year. But really excited about this Waikiki cold acacia. Saw one in a container out in California at a, at a show earlier this year in a container. And it was this big and this wide, leaves this big on it. Just really, really striking, striking plant. These are available. Uh, I know now, uh, finally, you know, this is one that I, I'd known about for a while was coming. And I think there finally are numbers at box stores, garden centers. I think you can find this Waikiki uh, cold acacia. You may even be able to find it on uh, Plants by Mail, which I have a link down below, uh, all of the videos on the channel for Plants by Mail. One more dahlia on this front garden row. We have the annuals in the front, and then you'll notice the second row is mostly perennials with a couple holes back there as we've gone along. Uh, this dahlia is called Bluebird. Uh, really look forward to uh, getting a couple flowers on this one. The foliage looks great. It's come back very, very sturdy from last year um, after, after, after a good winter sleep. There's a lobelia or cardinal flower here. Uh, this is Queen Victoria. Uh, it's about to start uh, opening, about to start opening some flowers and probably nothing. None of our native perennials any better for hu getting hummingbirds in your garden than lobelia. Again, it's another one that would probably would thrive a bit more, honestly, in a, in a leaner soil, meaning just my native soil. Uh, it would probably be much larger. This is one of those that, you know, I see six and eight feet tall in, in gardens or, or in the wild. So, uh, you know, again, it's, it's, it's fairly stunted, but it, it, looks, it looks okay. I think the, um, we have one in the front garden that's a little bit fuller. More uh, agapanthus coming back. With lots of agapanthus in this garden. This is ever white, just starting to show some flowers. And these flower spikes are just coming. So we're, we'll have flowers on these all summer. You see the, uh, you should see our, native bumblebees trying to get into these uh get into these flowers is kind of funny and all the bees uh, all, all over them this is a touch of gold holly ours is not quite as bright as it would be if it was in a bit more sun but it still looks great this is a gold hugendorn holly uh, when it was kind of funny without leaves on the trees above us during the winter time it was actually more gold than it is during the summer when the oak above us leaves out uh, it kind of dulls it just a bit. So put this one out in the full sun and it really, really is a show off. The very first video started on this side with the screening plants that go along behind where uh, Steph is standing right now. We're, we're, we have a path that's gonna come through here. This feeling blue, Deodor Cedar, is going to move into a spot here behind uh, where that fountain is sitting right now. And uh, that's gonna open this path up like we had originally wanted it to. This feeling, uh, feeling blue Deodor cedar is a weeping, as you can see, a weeping variety, but I can come in here and I could stake up a limb like this, okay, and get it growing vertical for a little while and then allow that one to kind of weep down. Uh, so I can, I can gain height in this if I wanted to. That's what I'm going to do when I move it over here. I don't want it just to keep getting wider at this height. I would actually like to, again, I'd like to stake a piece up on it, get that to be kind of a central leader and then I'll just kind of determine, you know, the height I want on it. And then just from there, let it fall back down. I've seen these as wide as 12 and 15 feet wide. You could probably put a tunnel through it if you wanted to. Really be uh, beautiful uh, Deodor cedar. Uh, and, uh, you know, regular Deodor cedars get 75 feet to 100 feet tall. This one will be whatever height you want to keep feeling blue. This is a salvia. It should be called bully. Uh, 
because it is a, it's a real bully here in the garden. Uh, this is Rhythm and Blues Salvia. Every time this thing comes up, it comes up wider out in the shrubs and we had to clean it up quite a bit. Showed it in a video earlier this season how much this thing actually, uh, here's a honeybee on it now. Um, and we'll, you know, we have the honeybees in the front garden that you'll see. Watch how he shortcuts this whole thing. He can't go down the flower. So he goes on the calyx, drills a hole in it and gets the uh, nectar that way. It's pretty clever. Here comes another honeybee to do the same thing. But our native bees love this thing. Hummingbirds love this thing. Butterflies, everything love it. And they, a lot of them have a different way to access it. But this is probably number one hummingbird. And if I'm looking for a hummingbird in the garden, this is probably where I would stare for a little while because um, they'll fly in here several times during the day. That Again, that black calyx, you know, even after the flower has finished, you know, you still have this black stem. This is another one we can just cut right in half midsummer if we want to, and it'll just flush right back out and get to blooming again. Typically though, we'll take something like this and just cut half of it um, in half and then cut the other half in half when that one starts blooming again. This is a variegated hydrangea paniculata called Yuko Geshi. Yuko Geshi, yes. Got one flower on it. This is not a particularly good flowering uh, hydrangea paniculata, uh, but it does have all the flower parts. Something I would like to point out. Um, it has the sterile inflorescences, the little white sterile pieces around the edge, but then this is the fertile flowers are in the center of it, which means you're gonna get uh, pollinators on that. Uh, this one's not, this is a delicate balance. We play with this plant because it's in more shade uh, than it would like to be able to flower. But if I had it in more sun, the foliage would be burning. So this one needs a little bit of water right now. I can almost, I can, uh, after doing this for so many years, I can kind of tell before something even wilts, you know, how, how the leaves feel on it is, uh, it's a bit dry. It's one of the last spaces we get to to water back here. Turning the corner to the back garden path, as you can see, there, you know, there's lower things growing along the uh, path edge over there. Here's the other white wedding hydrangea that's back in the back here. The butterfly bush is kind of in the middle of the two, but again, just ri really rigid, upright flowers. I think we're two weeks away from really seeing really good color on these. Like other paniculatas, they start out kind of that lime green color and then get whiter and whiter and whiter throughout the season. This is a Ralston's Hardy Viburnum. This is a uh, basically a dwarf variety of our native viburnum obovatum. It's very heavy flowering native viburnum that gets these white clusters of flowers on them and can get 15, 20 feet tall. This is as big as this thing has gotten in three years and it's, you know, two and a half feet tall, maybe three, and a half, three to three and a half feet wide, something like that. It's not flowering now, and this is one of the few times that we would actually photo this thing that wouldn't be blooming. There's a group of these in front of the D.H. Hill Library over on NC State's campus. We showed over on the garden plants with Jim Putnam channel. Uh, if you wanna go back and look at a full video on this, uh, I guarantee you there's one that's flowering over there. In a group of 50 or more, one of them would be flowering. And it's probably, not exaggerating, five or six months out of the year, this thing's in flower. As soon as it, we get some cool nights late summer, it'll start, it'll start flowering again. There's some creeping raspberry that was placed um, here. I've drowned it in a little bit of mulch, so it's gonna take a minute for it to, uh, to find its way back along again. But there are ground covers all over the place here, hoping to reduce mulching in the future. And the shrubs are gonna kind of fill in and take the area uh, as well over time. So be le less of this mulching. The holly next to me is called Golden Oakland Holly. It's an upright, a narrow growing uh, cultivar, as you can see, uh, fruits heavily. Uh, this one's in a little bit. Um, again, we're back here on a shade line, and this is one that you'd think you'd need to grow into full sun to keep it full. And I really haven't had to do any shearing on it. I thought initially I was because it was a little thin when it was about this tall, but it's actually filled in perfectly without doing any actual pruning to it. And I want to keep this central leader and just keep it going upright. I probably I'll at some point shear a little bit of the width out of it, but in the meantime, I mean, look how perfect it looks back here. You'll see another one in a container out in the front garden uh, in maybe the next video. One other thing I'd like to point out on the Ralston's Hardy Viburnum is what a great, it's a great substitute plant for some of our just more basic hollies like soft touch hollies and you know, some of our Japanese hollies. It's a native, it's gonna bloom where you know, those, those will bloom, but they're very insignificant. This actually has a showy flower. And again, 
I want to point out that thing's in a lot of shade. The ones in front of the DH Hill Library over there are getting blasted with full sun. Uh, and they're in a very urban space over there. Uh, and this is extremely dry and probably the last plant that would actually get watered here on this property. If we need to water, that plant is the last one. This is solar flare. This is a native azalea or deciduous azalea called solar flare. Incredibly showy, orangey flowers on this one. Several weeks back at this point, it's just putting on new growth. These are Buddy Lee's selections. He's um, uh, the inventor of Encore Azaleas and a few other plants that we've already seen in this garden that I haven't pointed out. He's introduced a lot of plants into the, uh, into the horticulture. And uh, this is a superior, really superior uh, native azalea. Really to me, uh, it's great flowering, but almost the foliage is so much better on this plant. We, we, they get kind of tired here, especially in the Southeast by the end of summer. And this one, the foliage looks great, which means we also get the fall color on them. Uh, we don't, fall color is not something we look forward to here in the South like folks do in the North. Uh, our plants tend to have such a long season that they just kind of get worn out before they get to that point where they can have that great fall color. This one just holds up extremely well. So it gets, you know, bright yellow color in the fall, you know, as an added, as an added bonus. These can get quite tall in the future. They only get pr pruned once a year. They set their flower buds by midsummer or so. So you don't want to do any pruning on this thing after midsummer. And then they carry those flower buds through the whole winter. It's, a ro it's a rhodod in the rhododendron family and it does the same thing that you know rhododendrons do where they hold those flower buds up big and tall through the whole winter, exposed like that. And then you get this anticipation of them flowering uh, during the uh, winter time. There's a brunera. Uh, right here this one would probably prefer that we were uh, irrigating a little bit more back here you can see that little crispiness along the leaf uh, as a result of that flowered earlier in the season with those kind of bluish flowers and then it has this great variegated foliage again this area back here is just extremely dry and uh, it would i think if we were going to do some rearranging we would probably move a few hosta and a few brunera out of this area over to the more moist conditions around the porch over there, and then find the things that we know are a little more drought tolerant and replace them in those holes. There's a toad lily in this spot, and this is one of those, uh, it's a shade perennial for sure, but it might be a little too shady. And you can always tell when some, you got something in a little too much shade because it'll be leaning toward the sun. And that one definitely is leaning out here uh, toward, toward the sun a bit. So it's probably gone just past where it's com most comfortable you know, with the uh, amount of shade we have. Other than that, it looks good. The, again, this coloration you're seeing in these lower leaves is, you know, from a lack of water. We've, we're extremely dry right now, and we're trying to limit the watering uh, as much as possible, but we are starting to see some stress uh, caused by that lack of watering right this minute. This is a pittosporum that I won in a rare plant auction. Uh, it blooms beautifully, uh, scented, uh, I do not remember the species on this one. I'm going to have to. <laughs> and when you win something in a rare plant auction, there are probably not a whole lot more of them. So I've got to uh, get one of my uh, many uh, plant nerd friends to help me figure out what, what uh, species uh, this Pittosporum actually is. But it's grown beautifully back here. It's actually a great ornamental plant. And once I uh, figure out again uh, what which one this is, we have several. Let's see, we have... Uh, um, Pittosporum tuberi, that mojo that was in the uh, last uh, video, and we have Pittosporum heterophyllum, the variegated one that's in a container, I think that was in the second video. There are many, many species of Pittosporum, and this one is an upright uh, growing variety, very different foliage than some of the others. Uh, and again, great flowering plant. And once I figure out what it is, I may take some cuttings on it and maybe make it a little less rare because it looks like a great ornamental plant in the shade, shady conditions. So toward the end of video six, we have finally made it into the front garden. There are a lot of plants in that back garden uh, area. The street side of the property is the east side. This is where the sun's coming up and it's coming up right behind me here. And that back line that we were just on is the west side of the property. And we're gonna start in the front garden from going from, from south to north uh, across the property. This is another Roman candle podocarpus that was one in the uh, second video, but the one in the second video is in a moist area back there and it's been 
watered when things needed water out here. This one sits behind this Miss Kim Lilac and you sometimes forget about it. Uh, and so we put it in and then didn't water it initially. We don't do a whole lot of watering, but sometimes when things need water, we'll water the whole thing at one time, you know, to saturate the soil. This one literally gets missed over and over. And so it suffered from a lack of water. Then it got the December freeze and we're in an area where Podocarpus is, you know, on the edge, you know, if, you know they're, they're seven B to 10 kind of plants and uh, we're here in seven B and that, so December freeze whacked it as well and it's still surviving. I, I would say that overall, what I've decided is that plant is actually just a very tough plant. I mean, we've abused it in every way possible and here it comes flushing out from the bottom and it's, I think by September, it's actually gonna look fantastic and be the plant that it was supposed to be <laughs> without us abusing it. This is a lilac called Miss Kim. It's Korean lilac. Probably, um, there are lilacs that will bloom in the South that don't need as much cold treatment as other, uh, uh, as other lilacs do. But this one just excels. Uh, it's, again, it's in dry shade. There's a maple in the neighbor's garden over here. I'm sure running roots all around it. Uh, really doesn't get any extra water from us. The, the perennials that are around the base of it will get a little bit of water occasionally, but I'm never coming over here thinking, oh, I'm gonna water the Miss Kim Lilac. Once they're established like this, you can, you pro probably won't, you won't be able to see it, but it was completely purple you know, about two and a half months ago. And uh, you can still see all the remnants of the flower buds that were on it. There's an ajuga planted uh, underneath it, a royal standard hosta, which there were a couple more royal standards uh, in the back garden as well. It's about to flower, as are a lot of the hosta in the garden right now. But again, we're trying to, you know, I look at this space toward the end and there's some bulbs planted up in here that have died back. You're not seeing the bulbs. This whole place is also has, you know, bulb, uh, uh, when, uh, spring flowering bulbs that have retreated under the ground here in June. But I look at this space right here, and this is a space I had to mulch, and I'm thinking, I gotta find something for that, right? I wanna cover that ground. This is what the sajuga is doing here. There's an epimedium uh, in this spot. This is, okay, so I wanna show you something on some of this leaf chewing uh, that you might see in your garden this time of year. There's probably is leaf chewing to be worried about if a plant's really getting you know, torn, you know, torn up pretty badly. But if I see a leaf like this, okay, on this epimedium, you see how this is chewed on these edges like this? This isn't all likely a leaf cutter bee, which is one of our native uh, bees. There's several, several bees we call leaf cutter bees, but um, you'll see, especially on red buds, they love red bud leaves. But anytime I see this on the edge of a leaf like that, I know a leaf cutter bee, they'll, they'll line their nest. They're solitary bees live in the ground, they'll line their nest with the edges of these leaves. And so for me, that's a win-win. A native bee got a piece of this plant and it's not something I need to worry about because they took what they're gonna take and everything's fine, the plant's still healthy. There is a native blood root stuck back in here. And you can see, I wanna point out one of these leaves, just how cool the foliage is on a native blood root. They'll get a white flower on them, but I don't even need the flower because it's such a cool leaf on that plant. That one's so newly planted and it looks it's obviously dry right this minute, uh, but it'll, it'll, it'll fill in some space under this uh, lilac uh, over time. And again, it gets interesting white flowers. There's an ardesia that we planted way too late. That's a very definite tender plant here in zone seven if you, if you plant it in the fall like we did. So it got whacked pretty hard, but it's, uh, it's on its way back. Uh, right now there's a columbine out in front of the the camera. And these are kind of short-lived uh, perennials. This one uh, had a, a really very, very blue, uh, very, very blue flower on it. But again, it's not really thriving over here. This is another area uh, we've had a little struggle in the garden, just getting things going. The things that have gotten going now are looking fine. But initially, when we put something over here, we have to remember to water it because that maple in the neighbor's garden is definitely got running roots all through here. And so there's a lot of root competition. The things that are over here, we'll compete with them. Uh, it's just gonna take a minute. You have to think about it when you initially put them in the ground, uh, that they're gonna need a little extra and they're not gonna jump out like everything else does in the garden and just grows really quickly. It may take them a season or two. There's a strawberry begonia. Uh, this one's called Harvest Moon. Really interesting foliage on this one. Not a great looking addition for this spring. 
uh, and it's hit it's doing well already it's got new growth coming on it pretty fast there are a lot of terinia planted i didn't point them out in the back garden uh, again this is a dry shade space from that maple over here and it's definitely you know stunts things initially it takes things a little while to get going there are some uh, uh red vein sorrel right here we use this all over the garden they you know they'll get about this tall during the growing season we have them in containers we have them uh, along the uh, herb border uh, in the back garden and then there's some planted here we'll just do them from seed and to fill in spaces in the garden they're just great plants uh, for fill in space while we're figuring out what else we might want to grow out here and then they're just beautiful uh, in general long gated leaf with that purple veining in the middle of it is quite striking Oak leaf hydrangea here called ruby slippers. It starts out white uh, as you know oak leaf hydrangeas do, and then it fades to almost a reddish color. The inflorescence, which is quite big on it, considering this is a dwarf uh, oak leaf hydrangea, it'll get. You know, we could probably keep it in this range uh, in the future and allow these other ground cover things to just fill in the space around it. There's some woolly thyme in front of this rock, and just a great little ground cover. We're hoping we'll just creep in between. All of these rocks if we keep the uh, keep the weeds away from it little tiny teeny tiny flowers on it flowers are definitely super 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 insignificant but uh, it's on its way L nice little carpet if it gets occasional step on it it won't matter you can't just walk on it all the time but if it gets the occasional step applied to it it won't matter all that much this is another brunera uh, this one's called jack frost you saw the other one in the back garden this one's getting a little bit more sun out here uh, and it seems a bit happier. It's also a place that's probably getting a hair more water when, when the times we do water. Uh, and, and it's also a year more established out here. So it looks quite a bit better. Again, it had blue flowers on it earlier in the season. And now it's just settled into this, you know, beautiful foliage. Here's one of many of our ground cover sedums. This one's a newer planted one uh, called Sun Sparkler. And again, it's just planted in the, between those rocks there to just fill that space. So hopefully in the future where you see that mulch Right now, uh, in the future, it'll just be that uh, that sedum will fill that in, and, and wherever the brunera and the sedum decide to fight it out, they'll be just fine together. There's a hosta right on the back side of that uh, brunera called mouse ears. You can see tiny little thing. I can see back on the back side of it a little bit of nibbling from a from a rabbit back there. The flowers have kind of passed. On that one at this point a great little great little miniature hosta to put along a, a edge of a bed and it's already you know it came back up from it was planted last year it came back up this year it probably has three or so divisions at this point so if we wanted to divide it you know and come up we have lots of little spaces out here to fill so that's a great plant that could be popped out of the ground this next late winter and probably we get five plants out of it plug it in a couple different spaces carry it across the path maybe uh, there's some several coleus planted uh, around the landscape. This one's called Black Dragon. Again, just went in the ground, just getting started, but that'll be solid purple mass by mid to late summer. And this hosta uh, is called June. It's one that's been around for a long time. Very few hostas are showier than June. Again, several flower spikes coming up on it. We, most of the, you know, this garden, most of the things in this garden are, you know, two years or less. Uh, in age we've been working on this project for three years but the vast majority of the plants are two years or less so when this one goes to sleep one more time and comes back up next year it'll really be the plant you know that it's going to be the hellebore behind it is called ice and roses and what i'm so uh, what i love about so, so many of these new hellebore varieties is how the flowers kind of linger past their flower time this thing looks like it's still in flower right but it's you know long since showed its color and they have faded and they look great the foliage looks great on it uh, really super impressive uh, lots and lots of new hellebore varieties out there this hosta is called cool as a cucumber uh, super narrow foliage white you know you get these white ones and you really have to start thinking about how much shade they need to be in this is again this is a slightly drier than hosta would probably want to be really nice white flowers on that one nice white foliage but it definitely needs to be in uh, enough shade to not burn that thing here in the south where we're going to get 90 degree temperatures probably the rest of the summer and then we have a mountain hydrangea uh, back here it's a variegated mountain hydrangea or hydrangea serrata called amachi nashiki 
really beautiful modeled uh, foliage on that one. It has, you can see it's done what flowering it was going to do. It probably took a little bit of damage back in December and lost some of the flowers it would have had right now, but the foliage still looks amazing. It'll, you know, get three feet tall and three feet wide, something like that. Most of the hydrangea serratas or mountain hydrangeas tend to stay smaller than the hydrangea macrophyllas do. We'll wrap this part up with one of my favorite plants, but it hasn't really taken on the shape. It's starting to take on the shape uh, and color that it will be eventually, but it takes, again, it can take a couple years when you put something in the ground for it to get roots under it and start to look like it's supposed to look. There are tags in the garden here for bulbs. So as we're, you know, as the bulbs have retreated and gotten pruned back at this point, we make sure that you know they've been added to a list and there's a few tags out here because this is the time of year we're really particularly busy looking at all the holes that are out here and trying to find some additional ground covers some other small perennials and things that we can plug into these spaces again hoping to just get the ground covered uh, in the future so i'll finish up this video with this aspidistra uh, a lady or called asahi and this is one of my absolute favorite cast iron plants and I found it in a little pot like this big, and it's taken literally two years for us to see the first leaf on it that has the white top. So uh, this is one of the showiest, absolute showiest evergreen perennials. We're not growing this for a flower. We're growing this for this foliage. This leaf will end up about this tall uh, and have that white on the top of it. And it's just solid white across the top of this particular cast iron plant. So there you go. There's part six of our kind of detailed what everything that's in the ground uh, kind of tour and where it is at this point and how it's how it's working and how it's not working. And uh, thanks for following along with this. Uh, seven will be up soon.